Many of us are doing things that we actually don't like, or many of us are pursuing things and we're not seeing it through to the end. Or it feels like, ah, uh, I'm doing stuff, but I'm not getting the response that I want. And oftentimes conventional wisdom is just keep on going. Things are going to change. Keep on doing, keep the consistency, keep the consistency up. And sometimes consistency isn't the answer. Sometimes the pursuit of that thing isn't the answer. Sometimes that thing, may, it might even be destined to fail, but at least you've got the skills that you need that will help you build in the next season. Yeah. Or perhaps you need to change something about your circumstance in order to produce the result that you want. In the world of business, sometimes we have the pleasure of being able to start companies with our friends. That was my story for the first few businesses that I started. And in our episode of Pip Jameson, she spoke about some of her difficulties with having a co-founder. But my next guest have been able to find a way to make co-founding a business together work. Courtney and Renee have been best friends since secondary school and they are also the founders of TMS Sisters. TMS is a digital sisterhood designed to support women all around the world. Throughout 2023, they've been able to become published authors, host international events and host large-scale events, including at the Hackney Empire. In this episode, we explore the dynamics of working together as well as how they've mastered the business of content creation. I'm Claude Williams, the founder of Dream Nation, and this is the Behind the Dreams podcast. Hi guys, welcome to the Dream Nation podcast. i um, really grateful that you both have agreed to be my first guest today. Oh, thank Woo! you for having us. Such an honour. We for are so real. happy to be here. Watching you guys, I consider you both my little sisters, um, come up and create something honestly so beautiful and so amazing. It's been really inspiring. And I would love for anybody listening today to be able to walk away with some, I guess, practical insights on what did it take to build what you guys have um, in case they wanted to do something similar for themselves. Mm. Where did you actually start? What was it like at the beginning for you guys? <laughs> well, well <laughs> cast your minds back to the height of the pandemic. The pandemic yeah. yeah. Shall I take this one or you take this one? I mean, you've started. Uh, yeah, no, I, was, I was setting the scene. I was trying to set the scene. Well, cast your minds back to the mm. height of the pandemic. It's mm. circa November 2020. And <laughs> we are only being allowed to see like one or two other people. Mm. And Courtney being my best friend was one of those one p people that I could go and yeah. see. And for some context, me and Courtney had always wanted to do something together. Mm. So To My Sisters was actually previously a series on Courtney's YouTube mm. channel. For those listening that don't know, you should definitely get to know. But my best friend is also a content creator and has been a content creator on YouTube for the longest time, creating amazing content around wellness, well-being um, wow. and supporting women. The yeah, it's turned into real. an ad. Yeah, it's turned into <laughs> an ad. Um, really helping women with their personal development goals. So Courtney has definitely been somebody that has been in the game for a minute um and her work is really just a testament to that so we had been kind of like bumping into each other in various different contexts we had like spoken on the same panels we had been at the same events mm -hmm. and essentially we had the idea to collaborate on something big mm -hmm. and because Courtney already had the idea for two my sisters which had already been a series on her uh, um, platform we kind of said let's do a podcast. Mm. It was also at the time low stakes. So it wasn't necessarily a YouTube channel. It wasn't necessarily something that was high production at the time. It was very much a let's actually try and cultivate some kind of community around friendship. So November 2020, I think it was like the 8th of November or something like that. Yeah, that's when the first time I, I watched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I take my, my belongings, my bag, my bonnet, everything. <laughs> and I make my way to Courtney's house. And literally, in terms of, we were remarking at the beginning of this before we started rolling, we didn't have any fancy high-tech equipment. We had That's two cool. microphones that we clipped to Courtney's like window. <laughs> that kept falling <laughs> off like that every kept, six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that kept falling off every few minutes or so, but we championed through for a whole 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the first episode ever of Two My Sisters was called Frenemies. And we had a really candid conversation mm -hmm. around our relationship as friends, um, friendship in general and I think what was really beautiful about that start was that start would underpin a lot of the work that we continue to do at Two My Sisters right friendship and this idea of platonic relationships mm -hmm. being something that's actually worth pursuing um, and something that's actually really really important especially in a time where people can't see each other people's relationships are failing isolation is a really big thing mm -hmm. a lot of folks are dealing with loneliness it felt like at the time we were sharing a little bit of our sunshine with the rest of the world. Mm. So that's how two of my sisters started, literally in Courtney's bedroom. It's yeah. amazing. Crazy time. 
so it's great to hear that but I'm really curious as to like how did you maintain because right. the reality is a lot of people um including myself started things during the pandemic um we all had a lot of free time a lot of energy mm. etc but very few of them are still around today so what was it that I guess was different between the two of you when it came to this project that why you still exist and why you've grown so big now? I think what's been so beautiful about our journey has been evolving from, you know, best friends, co-hosts and now like co-founders and business partners and now living together is the thing she said about friendship is so key. It has underpinned everything. It's not just about, you know, being two very competent people, which we are. It's about actually honouring and respecting each other and wanting our friendship to survive and our business to thrive at the same time because I think there can be a temptation to take one or the other you know if our friendship thrives then we have to overlook certain things but if our business thrives then we kind of have to be a bit cutthroat and it's like no nah, we have to find you have we have to use wisdom to find this middle ground to be like you know what that's my co-founder yes we have KPIs yes but that's my best friend and I love her mm -hmm. and that means something in this dynamic and I think it serves us really well because it means that we're not just out here using our friendship as a gimmick but we're actually doing it in real life and we can talk about the challenges that arise from that because we're facing it on a daily basis and we can also talk about the benefits of that because we're eating the fruits of it mm. um and so it's so nice to like have brought her on and her just not only get the vision but also being the best person to actually expand it like i i always say Yes, TMS was like a brainchild of mine, but I had to put that in like her womb and just be like, you grow it, you do mm. the work. Because she, I couldn't have done what we've done on my own. Like yeah. as much as I started it alone. Oh, yeah. No, I really couldn't. <laughs> I really couldn't have like, when I, when I think about the expansion and the growth, and I think it's such a beautiful thing because it is a testament to sisterhood and the power of collaboration. You know, that scripture in the Bible that talks about one will chase a thousand and two will chase 10,000. I think there's so much multiplication in collaborating mm -hmm. and us doing this together with the purest of hearts and the purest of intention and her taking on something which I had started and making it her own. We wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for that. You know, yeah. I think it's hard to sustain something, especially this magnitude on your own. And we had to, you know, go through the teething issues of finding a dynamic that worked for us, but through sacrifice and respecting each other, but also being dedicated to our crafts and our skills and learning. Um, we've made this what it is. And it's just a, it's a blessing. Like it's a blessing to get to do something like this with someone who cares about it, but also mm. cares about you. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Hey guys, I just want to let you know that on November the 24th, 2023, we will be hosting our first workshop of the year. It's going to be focused on helping you to become a board member. For more information, visit the Dream Nation website at dreamnation.co. That's dreamnation.co. Often in the world of business, as you both are entrepreneurs as well, is we will be told you need to find your niche, you need to find your specific area to focus on, you need to find your topic. <laughs> yeah. And you guys don't really fit nicely into any type of box. Yeah. Um, mm. So you're literally going against the rules that an entrepreneur is taught almost from day one. It's my life story. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was literally waiting to life. say, it's definitely, yeah. definitely the life so story. So, how have you guys been able to break that rule and still succeed? And mm. has there been a price to pay in doing that? Oh, that's a great Ooh, question. That is good. <laughs> I think, okay, <laughs> one, for us, it's community first, right? So I think you can get very, in wanting to niche down, the struggle I've found is you want to create the perfect brand, the perfect bio, the perfect, you know, one liner that says, hey, I do this. And I think in our appreciation of the fact that communities are complex, sisterhood is complex like we as people focusing well as an organization focusing on the holistic wellness growth and development of women you realize that that holistic nature is complex mm -hmm. and so for me embracing that has meant we're not going to have that perfect one-liner you know we give our one-liner at the beginning of the episode and then we go into something completely different <laughs> which is relevant mm -hmm. but it's still like you can't box in what we're trying to do because it's just too big for a one-liner um, and so with us, it's just been, this is what we're going to roll with. And if it's going to be impactful, then that's better than it being succinct and, and very mm. neat. Um, but in terms of what has it cost us? 
I think firstly, people looking at you and being like, so what do you do? And right, you're like, right. let's go to the beginning. Mm. It's a digital sisterhood and, and all of these things mm. you kind of have to unpack and people seeing it as, I mean, now that the, the numbers are behind it, people see it as legitimate. But in the beginning, it was very much like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cute, cool. Um, I also think in navigating brand partnerships, it has been a bit it has taken a lot longer. Like with the numbers we have, because we don't have that specific niche, it has taken a bit longer for us to say, get the partnerships that we really are getting now um, to do the work that we want to do. And I think that's just because brands do want to partner with somebody who they can say, Mm -hmm. oh, this is specifically what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, But thankfully for us, like with the rate of growth and also the community support, two of my sisters has just kept growing and it's kept being self-sufficient yeah. um, from from the get-go in terms of making revenue, which has definitely taken off the pressure, mm-hmm. I think, because I think one thing that makes people want to niche down so much, especially in trying to pitch themselves for brand collaborations or things like that, is because they are st- strapped for resources you know but for us it was kind of like nah this thing is you know very low cost to produce and we're doing this out of the love of our hearts and thankfully all of our life work so far has prepared us for this it seems so we don't really need to hire too many people a lot of it is diy and we don't have to compromise (laughs) so i think that's another thing you kind of have to like if you're going to be a rule breaker to some degree you really have to stick by your guns on what it is you're doing and be prepared to take the consequences that come with it. Mm. And for us, we were just like, how do we get best prepared to, you know, really go at this for the next like three years if no one wants to partner with us or if no one understands what it is that we are doing, like yeah. what's going to keep us encouraged and it's, it's paying off. <laughs> we're hanging in. I'd really love to hear a little bit more around the background around actually how did you guys get to this point? So we've heard mm. the start of TMS, but that's not the start of your stories. Mm. And of course, like we cannot finish this podcast without getting a little deep into the, the relationship between you guys. You've already touched on that quite a bit. Um, and even hearing it, it does, it reminds me a lot of my own story, mm. in all honesty. Um, so a lot of people don't know this, but Doom Nation is actually like my seventh brand that I've built. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, I started a long time ago. But the first six, um, I did with my best friend as well. Mm. Um, so like listening to you guys kind of speak and like hand, hearing that dynamic and that support has reminded me so much of that. Um, and yeah, I definitely would not be where I am uh, with, if I didn't have him when I was building it. And even till now, he's still one of the most supportive people. But yeah, going backwards, because mm. uh, yeah, like I know when I started my first, I was about 17 or so. Wow. Um, so it took, a, it took a long time to get there. And I know... Yeah. Courtney, I know you were on YouTube for a oh, long time before crazy. this. And Rene, I know you was uh, doing like a million projects, literally. Oh, yeah. Honestly, so and killing everyone. She was. Yeah, she yeah was. I'm killing myself yeah. in the process. <laughs> <laughs> to be, to be so, fair. Rene, let's, let's start with you. Like, what were, as briefly as possible, mm. <laughs> what was you doing before you got to this point? <laughs> that was like a challenge. Like, <laughs> what were you doing before you got to this point? A million and one different things. And I think what's actually wonderful about like this particular episode Mm. is I have the two closest people to me that is a testament to Mm. seeing that unfold in my life. Like I can remember the amount of times that we've had our own catch ups and I'm like, Lord, I'm doing this. And you're like, so is this like the ninth thing that you're doing (laughs) today? Um, But Renee before two, my sisters. So I'm very much a big nerd. I love education. I love learning. That's never been something that I've been able to shake off. Um, And like right before to my sisters, as Courtney mentioned, um, I had been doing my master's in international education policy at Harvard. um, And I also loved writing. So I had a writer's community as well called the World Collective. So I've, I've always been someone that loves like community building. I've loved education. I love like empowering people to do better for themselves. Um. So those were the kind of things that I was doing. I also flirted with YouTube for a little bit. And it's so funny that when like Courtney was mentioning like to my sisters, it feels like there are certain elements of like my story that have kind of merged into to mm. my sisters or I found the most appropriate outlet or the most appropriate like space for me to manifest these things that I've, I've always loved, but haven't really been able to take off myself. So I had my stint in YouTube because it was the hip thing to do at the time. And I was like, oh, you're going to be one of those education YouTubers. But I really hated it. <laughs> I, there was just something so 
not disingenuous, but it wasn't something that I felt like I could sustain by myself. Mm. And I felt like I wasn't at the correct place in my trajectory to be able to do that. Like I'm very much the kind of person that likes to go away for a while, focus and produce. Like I'm an executor or I'm very operationally minded. And sometimes in the process, it can be really difficult to share the process because I'm so focused on the process. Mm. So having to create at the same time as having to share was really, really difficult for me. And it's something that I have been challenged by, but also sharpened by engaging with someone like Courtney because Courtney is literally queen of being able to show you the process. Like whether it's dusty or whether it's polished, she'll be able to show you in a way that actually speaks to what you're going through. Whereas for me, I'm very much a like, I need to go away and do some stuff because I'm very much like tunnel vision in that way. Um, so I had my stint in YouTube. Um, also really, really just loved writing a lot. So I used to write prolifically. I, very um, prolifically. Yeah, very <laughs> prolifically, like literally every single day. Mm -hmm. But I think that was also a great skill that helped us a lot into my sisters too, because yeah. it's now translated into, I mean, we have a book now, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it's translated into blog pieces. It's translated into smaller things like even social media strategy and captions for like um, the distribution of our podcast. It's translated into the way that we've been able to articulate ourselves on our podcast, mm -hmm. which so many of our community members really, really resonate with. So in a weird way, as much as everything that I used to do before and to some extent continue to do whilst I'm doing to my sisters, as much as it felt so disparate and kind of disconnected, I remember in the conversations I've had with you, I was always like, yeah, I'm multifaceted queen. And you're like, yeah, Renee, but you're going to have to like find mm. some way to channel that effectively. And funnily enough, To My Sisters has been the perfect way for me to channel all of these different things that I do in a way that was purposeful, in a way that was impactful and, and in a way that actually resonated with a lot of people. Okay. Before I come to you, Courtney, no worry. I want to dive a little deep into something with you. <laughs> so with all the things you've done, there would have been a lot of mistakes that were made along the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was so loud. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> If you had to pick one mistake, mm. which has been, I guess, fundamental in you being able to build this business today, mm. what would you say that is? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Because I have so many mistakes. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to, what is the biggest one? The mm. biggest. It doesn't like, have to be the biggest. That's an important one. I think the most important one for me was my YouTube channel mm. because I feel like if I had continued my like individual YouTube channel, it would have diverted my attention from to my sisters too much because I would have been thinking about like myself and my brand as opposed to the work that we're trying to do at TMS. So I think that would have given me too much of a focus because me being the kind of person again that is very tunnel visioned when it comes to my outputs and very tunnel visioned when it comes to creating things. I think that if I had continued that, and if I had actually been serious about developing the level of skill that was required to sustain that, mm. I think that would have directly and probably actually negatively impacted to my sisters because, yeah, I would have been too focused on that and too focused on building my brand as the business as opposed to to my sisters, the business. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. That's all right. Wow. Courtney. Yeah. Was that new to you? It sounded new like that it was new was to you. It was very new. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're asking a great question. Yeah. No, it was, it was new and it's, it's nice to hear because I do see how complementary our skills are. And I think mm. that's just something, I guess, finding a co-founder, you want to have like complementary skills. And I think it has required us to both focus on very different things so that we can bring those things together. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I yeah. benefit greatly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Co-founders are so important. Yeah. yeah. So, Courtney, yeah. let's hear about your backstory. Well, in the beginning. <laughs> way back when. <laughs> in the back <laughs> when. <laughs> um, so, I studied an undergraduate um, degree at Cambridge. I was studying human, social and political sciences. And whilst I was there, I started my YouTube channel. And I purely started my YouTube channel because I wanted to have conversations about taboo topics because I one thing I hate is the <laughs> elephant in the room like I'm the person who's like let's open the door let the elephant out like let's talk let's about gist. what let's just <laughs> let's talk um and I've always been somebody who was quite confident in doing that and so I started my YouTube channel and it really helped me to gain this passion for using media to impact people in real life and you know I'd 
create videos around education. We did a video, I think a couple months after I started my channel, talking about how we got into Oxford and Cambridge, purely because when I, we were applying to mm -hmm. Oxford and Cambridge, we didn't see a video like that. And it was like, someone needs to help, you know, <laughs> a young black girl like us, um, who's trying to figure out this magical place that people, you know, equate to Hogwarts, which seems impenetrable. And now we're here, let's just kind of, you know, lift up that, that, curtain a little bit mm. and so we created that video and people really were impacted by it and like till now when I go back to Cambridge to do work people are like oh I watched that video and now I'm here and it's like wow see online content offline impact mm. I want to do this and um before even going to uni I worked as a hairstylist and my passion has always been for women's wellness and like them just feeling the best version of themselves and if you I'm very I'm very sure it's similar to the barbershop where you sit in someone's chair and it's like it's either a therapy session or it's like a community link up you're just it's a new dynamic of sisterhood mm -hmm. and I think being a salon stylist and getting to interact with women that way and then going on to work in business development at an e-commerce company for women's beauty and wellness definitely gave me that passion for women's development in a different way um, because I did have to think about marketing, branding, storytelling, but specifically targeted towards women and you know, hair and beauty is something that's so tied to like our identity as women. And it was so nice to be at such a intimate place for women, like a hair salon or like where they go to, you know, feel their best. And so many women would sit in my chair or I'd meet so many like women on set when I was working who would ask for crazy advice. And that's where the kind of desire to solve dilemmas came from because people would sit in your chair and suddenly they take off their wig and it's like <laughs> my man is cheating on me and you're like let me just heat up the straight now we're gonna come back <laughs> we're gonna come back to this um and so even small things like that seeing how that now assists you know and has culminated in the work we do with tms has been beautiful um so yeah i continued to be a creator and i even went on to um create my own e-commerce brand which mm -hmm. was called cdb london which was all about making hair easy and like really breaking down the complexities that exist and just trying to get you know good hair extensions good wigs and stuff like that and it really grew during the pandemic um we got to the point where we're like making six figures i'm leading a team of like eight people it was fantastic and it was like oh this is my dream life as an entrepreneur but similarly i was killing it and it was killing me like i was <laughs> tired i was burnt out i was doing this without any like investment or anything like that so mm. to have gotten it to this point when it has started literally with me making wigs in my bedroom it was mm. like this is so amazing but I don't know how to scale this and one thing I've also you know struggled to navigate is that title of being an entrepreneur mm. um, because I very much just felt like a hustler a creative and you know very thankfully the things that I touch seemed to turn to gold and it was working but I was struggling to know how do you multiply this how do you scale this past the six figures and people are asking you questions now like do you want to get investment do you want to start talking to investors and I'm like I don't know what any of this means mm. I'm basically still doing this for fun mm. and I don't feel equipped enough as an entrepreneur in the traditional sense to make these decisions as like a 22 year old you know person who's navigating post-university life and so I got severely burnt out and it was affecting my health and something I've like widely discussed is like women's health issues and how it impacts them um, in terms of you know their wellness and productivity and I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome when I was 19 and it was something that was affecting my ability to be productive and I realized that me working in this way actually wasn't best suited for my body and my brain and the way my body was, you know, wired and what it was fighting against. And I had to make a very hard decision to be like, you know, yes, people know you as this, but you're going to have to say goodbye to it because if you don't, you're going to lose yourself in the process and you're really going to not only burn out, but like affect your health. I would say the first gala we organised, in my opinion, was a mess. Um, people enjoyed it. I, 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 feel, I believe I was there as, yeah. as well. I don't think it was messy. You didn't come to the first I did, one. I didn't come no, to the first you didn't come to the first okay, one. Okay. I know for sure, actually. Um, the only saving grace is what actually became a Dream Nation tradition was like, I said to myself, there's so many things I haven't delivered on, but if I give people free run punch the whole night, Screaming. then that will at least cover a lot of problems. And it did. <laughs> so that, <laughs> so that's the reason why whenever we do like galas and a lot of things I do for Dream Nation, there's normally free run punch throughout the whole night. Rene, what does success look like for you? I think success 
first of all, my success is underpinned by my ability to actually define it. I think that in of itself is a superpower because again, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of us just defer mm -hmm. that success to other people to define for us. Mm -hmm. So for me, an actual win is being able to sit down and have the conversation with you of saying, actually, this is what my future looks like, yeah. or I've won because I've been able to achieve this. Um, and I think this is a difficult question for me because as someone that's now embraced this whole lifelong learning and um, optimization and being that kind of person that's always like literally obsessed with like self-improvement, success to me is, funnily enough, I've gotten to a place where success to me is more about the process and enjoying the journey as opposed to arriving at a destination. Mm -hmm. Because one thing about a destination is you're going to arrive there. But then when you arrive, what, what do you do after that? Yeah. Right? Like what's the... What's the meaning? What's the point? And I think the beautiful thing about embracing journeying is that you get to constantly rewrite. Like you hit a, um, a pit stop and then it's like, this is great. We um, sit down, we brainstorm, and then we keep on going. So for me, success is being able to define my success first and foremost. For me, success is being able to enjoy the journey of pursuing the things that I really care about, like I actually love doing. I think that it is a privilege and I know that, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that have passions and dreams and things that they want to do, but they actually have a whole host of other blockers, right? And I think it's important to acknowledge that it's not going to be easy for everyone, right? We're starting from different places. There are people that are coming from backgrounds where they've had to move heaven and hell just to get to where they're at. Mm. And that's not where they want to be. Mm. So I think even that, the privilege of being able to pursue the things that I enjoy, being able to pursue something like to my sisters, to me, it's a privilege and that's a success in of itself. To me, um, success is actually being able to pursue like content creation because that's a privilege in of itself. Mm. I have the resources, I have the materials to be able to do that. Um, success to me also looks like being able to pursue like relationships I really care about. Like mm -hmm. I have friends, family, a community of people that actually really care about me and love me and support me. Maybe like, you know, it, it can be difficult at times. Mm. You know, relationships are hard. Um, even between myself and Courtney, sometimes it's difficult because mm. there are things that we have to overcome. Mm. But the success is the fact that I still have that, right? Like the fact that we're even still friends for, it's been a long time. I've known Courtney <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we're still friends and we'll continue to be friends. Like I often joke about with Courtney and say, I'm going to be the one that's like hiding your teeth in the old people's home. <laughs> I'm going to be the one that's wheeling you towards the window or something or like jamming your wheelchair and stuff. Um, but for me, success is being able to continue to invest in those relationships, those lifelong relationships that I know will stand the test of time. Mm. Um, and then I think lastly for me, success is also like, being happy with myself, like actually being content. Mm. I think that both of you will know this, but I definitely have perfectionist tendencies and mm. it was definitely extremely severe when I was younger. Like mm. I was the kind of person that didn't even sit and rest and be like, oh, actually, Renee, you did good. Let mm. me give myself my flowers and sit down for a second. I think part of the restlessness that I had and part of the reason why I was constantly doing multiple things at different times was because I didn't actually allow myself to celebrate myself mm. and like, sit and bask in the fact that I'd actually done some really cool stuff. And for me, success is very much giving myself the opportunity to actually like say, Renee, you did okay there. Like you yeah. did good. Like affirm myself and actually think, oh, you know, you're cool. You're good. Like you can stay for a minute. You don't have to be jumping to project to project. You don't mm -hmm. have to be jumping to uh, metric to metric. You don't have to constantly be chasing. There are periods that you can actually sit down, rest and say, you've done a good job. You guys followed the, I guess, the three steps. I'm always teaching entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, or people or leaders in general, like what all leaders need so to you do. You know, we're friends. Yeah, <laughs> it's um. So I always tell people it starts with a vision. Mm. Um, you, as a leader, you have no excuse to not have a vision for what it is that you want to go on to do. Yeah. But once you have that vision, it's done around providing a team that can deliver on that. And mm. you guys sound like you've done it in two ways. It's you have each other, firstly, mm. and then you have like probably your direct team around you, so managers, etc. But then your community now becomes part of that team mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And lastly, what you've done done is you've made sure that that community has the resources that it needs to be able to succeed. Yep. And to me, it's like the fact that you followed those laws are ultimately like it shows in your success. So 
Well done. I don't know if you did it on thank purpose, you, but you, you're doing it right. You're doing it right. Hey there. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. One thing that we want to do is we want to make this as interactive as possible. And with that, I would love to hear if you have any questions or dilemmas you would like us to address in the episode. To do that, visit dreamnation.co forward slash podcast and submit the form that you'll see there. I think we all have seen like the whole influence of the world. The yeah. world has changed a lot yeah. in that regard. Ah, my favorite um, thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we know there's a lot of money to be made in yeah. that space. Um, I guess what I, if I was a listener of this podcast right now, what I would be wanting to ask you is how on earth do you get a brand partnership? How mm. do you do that? So I think the first thing is people are often deceived into thinking it's about the size of your platform. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I learned like from doing YouTube, and I think this was one of the key things I was able to bring to like our dynamic was like, okay, we don't need to be big. We just need to be strong, mm -hmm. right? We need to have a right. strong message and we need to build a strong community, not necessarily in size, but in devotion. And one thing we've always put first is one, our content has to be valuable. There's no point wanting to monetize in my opinion, content that is not valuable in some way, even if it's just entertaining, entertainment is valuable. You know, mm. it provides us all with relief and things to be able to engage with in our spare time. You know, I think about how long I spend on Netflix. Is it valuable? Yes. Am I learning? Maybe not. You know? <laughs> so, but things like that, you have to think, how am I actually bringing value to people and reiterating that as well to make sure your content is just getting better is important. So firstly, focus on the content itself. Once you feel like you're strong with that, you can either pitch to brands in terms of, oh, here's what we're doing. This is the specific way we see ourselves partnering with you. Would you like to come on? Or sometimes you will just find that brands will inevitably you know just contact you because brands need those partnerships as well you know it's just it's a mutually beneficial partnership so what we have seen is that people have contacted us um, and then it becomes about knowing what your value is and being able to not look at not just look at the value you provide for your community but also the value that your community has whether it's in the numbers, whether it's in their buying power, um, whether it's in raising brand awareness, what are you doing and how well can you organically integrate that brand, that product, whatever, into your content? Mm -hmm. And that's an art form in itself. I think you have to be very mindful of, you know, thinking about the key stakeholders in that partnership. You've not only got yourself and the brand, but you've also got the listener, or the viewer, the community member who's engaging with that and wants to feel like it is seamless. Mm. Um, and so once you think about that, I think the next thing is being confident and bold enough to ask for what you are worth mm -hmm. and to really know what your numbers are worth, which is something which we have known from the jump, I think being content creators respect for, respectively, um, but brands haven't always wanted to hear because I think, and one thing any entrepreneur creator is going to have to be mindful of is people will want to take advantage, right? We're living in a capitalistic world. Everyone's trying to get things for a rate which benefits them more so than you. And you have to be mindful that you may have to turn down things if the numbers aren't right, mm -hmm. if it doesn't align with your values and you have to be willing to turn away. So that first thing of just making sure you're in love with the content first really does matter. But once you do start making those, you know, the big bucks, it's mainly going to be based on what can you offer? So really think about your packages. What do we offer to brands? For us, it's like add integrations in the podcast, but then you can also separate that into, well, we have a YouTube version and an audio version. If you just want the audio version, it's this much. If you just want the YouTube version, it's this much. If you want to sponsor a whole episode, if you want to just have a segment, where do you want that segment to be placed? Mm -hmm. Breaking it all the way down to really thinking about, what is most valuable and how do we price that um and now that we're doing that way more often we've brought in managers who can purely focus on the brand partnership size because you know being hosts being founders doing the community engagement and then now doing the admin and all of that managing those relationships and searching for new opportunities is actually really long and quite hard mm -hmm. so if you can find a way to collaborate even in that sense, whether it's building relationships with people in PR, building relationships with people who um, 
are, are working on brand partnerships with internally for these organizations um you are well within your right to do that and just pitch yourself and really believe in your source in that sense believe in what it is that you are building um shoot as many emails as you can forward but really invest in those relationships have the right conversations with people who can put your name at the table because i i will be honest even independently as a creator it sometimes does come down to who knows you yeah right and it's not even just the size of your audience especially when you are smaller there are so many fishes in this pond mm -hmm. you need to just be known you need to be the name so solidify your brand build those relationships think about the value that you have for your community as well as for brands and how you're going to make that manifest mm -hmm. um and once you do that i think it's just a matter of time, right. you know, it's just yeah. a matter of time and being as consistent as possible with that right formula. People will come forward with the budgets that you need. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so just think about what revenue models match your actual goals, yeah. what brands could align with that. We made a whole list before we started TMS. These are the brands we want to work with. Mm -hmm. And when we met our managers two years later, we gave them that very list and we say, hey, go and talk to these <laughs> people. <Make it> <laughs> yeah, you make that happen. Mm -hmm. And we want it to happen in this way, right? Mm -hmm. We don't just want to engage with these brands to just be like, hey, here's this foundation, go mm -hmm. buy it. Mm -hmm. We actually want this to be something about impact and the work they're doing for women. So right. we need to make sure we're aligned with them. And so making sure that they're even clued up on what we're doing and the fact that this is more than just a podcast, yeah. it's more than just a media empire, it is a movement. Mm -hmm is important for us. Absolutely. And just to add to that really quickly. Go ahead. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know you was looking like, oh, I know she got something to say. We ain't got time. But no, absolutely love everything. I was literally like, yes, Courtney. Yeah. Yes. Um, to add to that really quickly, always prioritize the relationship that you have with your community. Yes. Always, always, always. They mm. are where you get your money from. And um, because of that, you need to be, at least for us, we are very transparent with our community. Yeah. Especially women. We're very much like, yo, if we're making money from this, we'll let you know. Mm. And we'll also let you know where that money is going. Yeah. Right. Mm. So and for we'll us, even give you a slice. We'll right? even give you okay. exactly yeah. right. That's... We prioritize before we were even making money, money. We were, we were looking money away. <laughs> <laughs> we were looking at our bills. <laughs> And we were still giving money. Mm. <laughs> there were days that we would go to a little and Aldi and we yeah. would see that berries had increased in price again. <laughs> but still. <laughs> we were prioritizing giving. And yeah. I think it is remembering where your money comes from and remembering that the value comes from the value you've provided to your community. Mm -hmm. How many times do we see even within our own communities that folks think that because they've got X amount of followers or X amount of whatever, yeah. all of a sudden they can just be pushing any kind of product, any kind of way, any kind of how. Yeah, It's a relationship. Mm. And it is being bold enough, in, especially if you're a content creator, being bold enough to say, hey guys, I create this content yeah. for you. I really care about you and I'm actually giving you this much value. Just to let you know, I'm also monetizing yeah. this, please okay? Support. Like, please actually support me and support this. There yeah. are going to be some times where content creators or even entrepreneurs in mm -hmm. general will have to say, I need your support. And I think it's not shying away from that transparent relationship that yeah. we have with folks. Um, that's been a testament to, to my sisters. Yeah. And then again, like being very picky about our brand partnerships, right? As Courtney said, we had our list from beginning. When we were there in our bonnets doing that first episode, we said, we're going to work with this big boy, this yeah. big boy, this big... And we're wearing our pajamas. Mm. Two, three years later, it's Here actually happening, right? Beautiful. And it's that consistency as well. Mm. And our unwavering dedication to the vision that we mm -hmm. have for Two My Sisters, right? And also co-write that vision that you have for yourself. If you're a content creator, for example, or an entrepreneur, sharing that, mm -hmm. right? So, and making it very clear that money is necessary in order to do this. So for us, like making sure that giving was a central tenet of To My Sisters really demonstrated to our viewers that, oh, okay, if I do give my money and if I do invest in them, I know I'm investing in something that's bigger than the two of them. Yes. Yes. I'm not just investing in their latest Porsche or their self-driving <laughs> Tesla. Yeah. As much as that is nice, like, and even being super transparent to say that me and Courtney, we don't, we don't like actually pay ourselves from yeah. To My Sisters. Mm -hmm. It's actually reinvested. Majority, if not all of the money that we make is reinvested into To My Sisters. Mm -hmm. So it's even making our peace with the fact that, oh, this thing that we're doing, this venture, this content creation that we're doing, we might not actually see the fruits of it personally for a while, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's worth it because it means that the longevity, but also the trust that we have with our viewers, with our community, with our sisters, that's where we're going to make the most from. That's yeah. what we're going to leverage the yeah. most. So it's prioritizing that above everything. 
I didn't even know that you guys weren't really oh, paying yeah, yourselves no, like that. Okay. But yeah. so that once again, these are these are the common traits that I see in people that really go on to succeed, mm-hmm. having that long term perspective. Because I know to an extent, both your situations that you've made sure that you have ways to look after yourselves, oh, even now. Oh, <laughs> out, <laughs> we got clothes on our back. <laughs> so, but having that, I guess that approach of that diversified income stream yes. essentially means yeah. that you are able to make the money you're making and like I say reinvest it into your brand which it's showing like you're growing you're doing things that other people would never dream of really being able to do at your stage or how long you've been in this game and that's because now I know it's because you're reinvesting all your money back into it which is really wise there's so much more to dive into in mm. terms of uh, the content in terms of how you're building this business especially around brand partnerships I'm going to ask you on camera so you can't get out of it easily that I would love to do a workshop with you guys at some point collaborate oh, on actually yeah. doing do something because I think there's so much to dive into that <laughs> perfect and then the last thing that I'm going to ask you about for today is um, in terms of the monetization of your business mm. is your book deal so so many people would love to be able to say they're an author get a nice deal have a few zeros in there i'm not gonna ask you how many zeros are in your deal for now <laughs> um but when you're ready to share you can share but i do know behind the scenes that you guys did something very unique when it came to pitching your book could you tell us about that well <laughs> <laughs> i remember it like it was yesterday um <laughs> Um, what was interesting about the whole book shenanigans that yeah. we went through was we actually turned down our first book deal. Yeah. Okay. So we were approached at the time I was actually doing a um, writer's program um, with another friend of mine and we were working with um, Harper Collins mm-hmm. and I had met a lovely lady, Nancy, shout out to Nancy, because if it wasn't for her, we definitely wouldn't we have gotten any kind here. of mm-hmm. any kind of book deal. It was actually something on myself and Courtney's vision board for two my sisters yeah. in like five, 10 years time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we engaged with one of the houses of Harper Collins and, you know, they loved it. They said it was a great proposal mm-hmm. and then they came back to us essentially with a figure. I looked at Courtney. Courtney looked at me and we said, surely not. not. (laughs) We said, absolutely not. And at the time, obviously, we had no experience of being Mm -hmm. in the writing game. So we didn't know how much we were worth, but we knew we weren't worth that. And bear in mind, we're (laughs) navigating this with no agents, no no managers. This is us. We're like, we're brokering our own deal. And we're going in there like... Yeah, we know what we're talking about and it's not that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So we were kind of like, is it bad mind of us to... Because obviously it's your first deal. Maybe it's like these are the things that happen, right? Mm. Luckily, we actually have a whole host of friends um, who are in writing or who had had their books published. So a really good friend of ours, V Kativu, had had her book um, published by Penguin. Mm. And she was like, not that figure. Yeah. Mm. So we said, okay, cool. And then we went to go and hit up some of our other friends as well. um, Ore, Ore, Chelsea. Chelsea on taking up space they said it's a no from us dog Mm. so after actually hearing and it was really interesting because the majority of the people that we had approached were also black women Mm -hmm. Mm. and just hearing the experience of being in the publishing industry and also being um just basically undersold we went back to them and said look we're not taking this deal can you add some money preferably can you like double or triple it because what you've given us is just not it's <laughs> n- we're not going to sit down and write this book mm. so we wait and we're hopeful you know yeah. all that kind of stuff they come back to us and the figure that they had given us for the second time was so like the raise was so minuscule and as much as we're competent writers and we knew we would produce an amazing book we also wanted to do something that was not only worth our time but would really show that the publisher we were working with and this is no shade to anybody but that the publisher we were working with got the vision of what Mm -hmm. we were trying to Mm -hmm. do and the magnitude of it and what that figure was saying to us they don't get it Mm -hmm. a few like weeks later v asked us to host her um book launch yeah and we host it and we meet mire harper mm-hmm. and she had just left penguin and was going to bluebird at pan macmillan and she was like i would love to talk to you guys she funnily enough she opened the conversation with have you thought about writing a book yeah like, funnily enough, like, oh, we've got a story <laughs> we've got a whole proposal <laughs> and a contract that we didn't sign and we engaged in conversation and she got it And she took us to, you know, she brought us in as her first book signing Mm, at Bluebird, which was, you know, a very big deal. And we kind of had this very interesting conversation around money. And she understood from behind the scenes what we were dealing with and what our struggles were with the first offer. And so she went back and she really, I 
we believe really advocated for us mm -hmm. and pulled out an offer which was over double what we had gotten from the last place mm. and we were like okay let's go back and ask them for more yeah. again shooting mm. your shot and we got it okay. yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so we're like we're so thankful we didn't have to split 20 percent with any agent yeah. like we broke yeah. our, we broke our own deal and 15 weeks later we had written a book Amazing. Yeah. That was another thing. The turnaround time for our book was Crazy. insane. Wait, did you say 15 weeks? Yeah. 15 weeks. Mad. Because yeah. we wanted to get it in time for International Women's Day. Yeah, right. in 2023. So like, right. But yeah. we had no idea of what publishing timelines were exactly. like until Mireille said, okay, if this is going to happen then, we're going to need the full manuscript like six to nine months in, in advance. advance. Right, yeah. right, right. So we're like, ah, oh, do the maths. We're currently in yeah. March, April. Oh, you, you need, need this, this in June? Tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's, it's crazy because we had already been talking about the book for such a long time. So it was more so this thing had come with the quickening. And if we wanted to seize the opportunity, as much as like I was jet setting around the world, Renee was focused on so many other projects. We were just like, we need to get this book done. And we did. And now it's here. No one saw us for a very long a time. A long time. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> this book. Book, book, book. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. No um, I really have more I want to ask. But... <laughs> I'm starting to fear for my life. Save it for the <laughs> workshop. Save it for, for the, the workshop. workshop. So, Renee, Courtney, thank you guys so much for being my first guest. You were amazing. Thank you. Um, thanks for so were you. Thank Incredible you. host. Yeah. I'm so proud of everything you guys have gone on to do, everything that you're going to do next. I know there's still a few more secrets that you haven't yet said to the world. <laughs> um, and I'm excited for when everyone else knows about that too. But yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, going to be watching and supporting you guys from the sides. My final question to you both is who should I have on my podcast as a future guest? Who would I like to see on the Dream Nation podcast? Mm -hmm. 20 seconds. <laughs> Pressure. Oh my gosh. Pressure. Patricia Bright. Patricia Bright. Ooh, for me, Patricia Bright okay. to talk about the business of content creation and okay. having longevity in this game. She so actually has been a Dream Nation speaker before, so there we, we, go. Can, we can reach out Make to you. What, saying. what about you, Anna? This is hard. I don't know how you'll get this guy, but... Andrew Huberman. Okay. Neuroscientist from yeah, Stanford. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. it'd be excellent. Just a completely different angle to like practical dreaming, mm -hmm. how to take care of yourself and how to like optimize to be a practical dreamer. I think it'd be excellent. Amazing. Great. Thank you both. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. We release a new episode every Sunday, so make sure that you subscribe and follow us so that you never miss out. If you'd like some more inspiration while you wait for the next new episode, then check out the recommendation above. Don't forget to follow us on social media and you can send us a question or a dilemma that you'd like us to answer on the podcast. This is Claude Williams, you've been watching Behind the Dreams and we look forward to seeing you at the next Dream Nation event.